I always tell people when I speak, I'm not a purist in this space. I've never have been. Like I, I'm not benevolent because I have a, an opportunity to do good things. My charge as a business person is to make sure all boats rise. Hi, I'm Rachel Krause. And I'm Carol Stern. And we are here to explore and unpack the essence, architecture, and DNA of purpose across industries, professions, relationships, and even within paradox. So on this podcast, we're going to unlock the stories and the journeys of our guests. We're hoping to unlock pathways to grow, to gain, and to give. And for the next couple of episodes, we're going to be playing on purpose. Exploring the intersection of purpose and sports. Game on. So hi, everybody. It is great to be back to Listen on Purpose. As you know, we're doing this series, Play on Purpose, looking at the business case for purpose in all kinds of sports and sports-related industries. And I am so excited to have Kevin Martinez, a dear friend and the person who's doing all things social responsibility for ESPN. And so, Kevin, let's start with just who you are, a little bit of your journey. How did you get to your role? And uh, then we'll take it from there. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, I am in awe of um, being interviewed by Carol. Uh, Carol is literally like who you aspire to be. <laughs> so, Carol, so thank sweet. you for your invite here. I mean, the work that you have done, the the privilege that we have had to be able, and the blessing that we have to be able to do what we do. But you have set a standard um, that I think many follow, and I am grateful uh, that you have mentored me in a number of different areas. So let me just start there first. Um, oh, thank you, thank but, you. Uh, I Not will tell true, you, but thank you. <laughs> it is true, it's very true. So I'll start with, uh, you know, Kevin Martinez. So, you know, I, I think uh, what I always like to tell who Kevin Martinez is, is it's, you know, I am a amalgamation of many, many things. Um, when I get this question, it, it also depends on who's making the question and for what purpose, but I'm gonna be very broad, so just, just Give me direction uh, if I go too long or not deep enough. But, you know, I am a, a unique human being in the respect that I am multicultural. Uh, I have um, a partner of uh, 33 years, um, Hudson. I have, uh, you know, a family that grew up in the military. Um, my mother was Irish and Scandinavian. My dad was Mexican and Native American Navajo. I grew up in Hawaii, so uh, hence my, if you can't see, I'm wearing an Aloha shirt for Maui Strong today. Um, you know, I grew up with Pacific Asian Islanders as my best friends uh, at Radford High School in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, I am uh, a huge, avid, um, you know, fan of sports, uh, but I am also completely committed to making the world a better place. I have since I was a young kid, and I think actually sports brought me that. Um, the first time I ever watched the Olympics in 1968, I remember in Mexico City, uh, what was happening there. I was asking my parents, like, why are, why are they standing there with their fist, you know, in the sky? And, and it really struck a chord with me. I have since that time in my whole life been, you know, trying to function as a good citizen of this, this earth and try to do things that are meaningful not only to myself, my family, and my partner, but also to the world. Um, I have, uh, you know, grew up in Hawaii. I went to the University of Washington, go Huskies. I was a University of Washington cheerleader. Um, for many of you who don't know, this could be a, um, a further podcast. I helped create the wave in 1981 at the Stanford UW game, um, homecoming. Um, I uh, was communications and sociology. I started off as pre-med because I wanted to work uh, and do research medicine and find cures to certain things. But um, at the time I was working at Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center at work study, uh, counting blood cells and taking blood from kids that were dying of leukemia at like a 93% rate. I can tell you now it's about a 13% rate. So cancer research is working. Uh, start there. Uh, I went on to work at uh, a number of different uh, uh, agencies, uh, small agencies, uh, but I was, you know, um, I had a mountain of debt out of college. I put myself through college. I worked at McDonald's in high school, you know, so I didn't have a lot of money. My parents didn't have a lot of means. Um, so, you know, I did a number of different things, but I 
totally learned work ethic that I thought I would, you know, be able to go rule the world, uh, you know, with the jobs that I had. And, you know, it took me a long time to figure out it takes time and maturity and good people around you and timing and all those good things. But um, I left uh, the University of Washington, went on uh, to work in um, waiting tables to pay off my bills. Uh, then I went and got a job at, uh, was asked by a local, uh, county council person, uh, would I be interested in working on a campaign? I did, uh, ended up working for a gentleman named Gary Locke, who went on to be the ambassador of China, uh, commerce secretary. Uh, and he asked me to work on his programmings and community, um, of which I also said, could I work on sports and culture? And he allowed me to do that. So I helped blow up the King Dome, if anybody remembers what that was, uh, bring um, the Safeco Field, which is uh, now Lumen Field and uh, T-Mobile Field to its existence in the city of Seattle. Um, and then I worked for Ron Sims, uh, who was the county executive, and he allowed me to be part of a a bid for the 2012 Olympic Games. Uh, so you can see there's always this thread of sport no matter what I do. Um, obviously we did not uh, apply for that bid. Uh, we knew we weren't gonna get it, but I, it was a great uh, learning moment for me. Uh, and I happened to be working on a program to serve the World Trade Organization in Seattle. Uh, and uh, with uh, Ron Sims and the governor and a company called Eddie Bauer called me and said, hey, we really want you to come and do some public affairs for us. Uh, and that was 1995, I think, six. Um, and the reason that's important is because I went to go take that job. And uh, what it really became was an amalgamation of what is now corporate responsibility. So they gave me sustainability. We were the largest cataloger in the United States. Uh, Spiegel owned us at the time. We also were doing huge work in sustainability and because of the platform that we were on and Eddie Bauer for hiking and taking care of the environment. I did the volunteer events, I gave away the money and I did cause marketing. So uh, we started this program called Add a Dollar Plant a Tree so we could offset our carbon footprint and plant trees. And that became like the first kind of iteration. I also worked on labor practices and supply chain and then um, with WTO, uh, they came to Seattle. It's, that was the first riot in Seattle many years ago. Uh, but they, the um, anarchists, the people that were uh, rioting, they kind of take, they, they didn't break our windows because uh, we had done outreach with them proactively. Uh, from that, we were at a, a town hall and we were telling people, you know, w what it takes to be a good citizen. Um, and a a, a, a woman walked up to me from Starbucks and said, you need to come work with us. Just so happens that I knew her, uh, Lauren Moore, who is now the president of um, the Johnson & Johnson Foundation. Uh, I went over to work at Starbucks, ran their community programs. Uh, one of my um, hubris moments is I'm always proud to say I helped bring Ethos Water to Starbucks, which was a cause marketing program to help pay for the foundation to help drill water wells in Africa and coffee growing regions, but also fund the foundation and also, quite frankly, make resourcing and money for the company. Um, from there, I got a call by Home Depot uh, to run their foundation. Um, we created a whole program around disaster relief and was noted as one of the most important companies uh, after Katrina to help save people's lives. So I, I felt a great calling there. And then I got a call by KPMG um, to go make my millions of dollars in New York City, Carol. Uh, and I did it in 2008. And just as KPMG was uh, losing Lehman Brothers, so I was there for about 13 months. They took really good care of me. And I was like, oh, I'll never work again. They'll never hire me because of all this stuff. And about two months later, I got a call by the Walt Disney Company to help lead their foundation. I didn't get the job. So I was devastated because I knew all those people and I really wanted to work for Walt Disney. And two weeks later, they called me and said, do you like sports? <laughs> and that's how I got to ESPN is uh, they asked me if I wanted to lead the efforts here at uh, ESPN's Corporate Citizenship Group. And I know Rachel has a follow up to this, but before you ask it, Rachel, one thing you said that kind of struck me when you talked about ethos is, you know, Kevin, most companies have purpose over here and profit over here. And what was interesting about Ethos is, you know, it, it combined the two. 
And that's really the lion tree philosophy. We do not believe that purpose and profit have to be mutually exclusive. We believe one plus one equals three when you bring them together. So just, you know, I don't know if you want to comment on your thought on that, and then I'll give it back to Rachel. Well, I do. I, you know, there's, there's doing right and doing well. Um, and I, I always tell people when I speak, I'm not a purist in this space. I've never have been. Like, I, I'm not benevolent because I have a, an opportunity to do good things. My charge as a business person is to make sure all boats rise and to make sure that there is a foundation when business is bad, that things don't fully be taken away, that they see a value treatment for reputation management, for strategic investments, for, quite frankly, having stakeholders that will you know, be important and listen to you. Um, so there's so much more to corporate responsibility now called ESG um, than there was before. So to your point of making sure that there are strategic reasons for doing both sides, the hard part is keeping it in balance such that when you are really committed to something, you don't lose track of your company priorities or the community priorities in the process. Great answer, really. And just probing on that a little bit, a little bit further, um, what does the education process look like if you're introducing this to a, an organization or or gaining buy-in from stakeholders, um, internal culture, or the public? What does that process look like if there isn't so, alignment? You know, around that? I I think we spend the majority of our time. I'm going to say a good sixty percent of my day is evangelizing for our role and for the work we do. Even if you have a chairman or a president that is all in line, right, believes, there's still this daily argument of why. Why should we do that? You know, why this more than that? Why, why should we put energy into this when we really need to make sure that, you know, we have more basketball games uh, in our college football portfolio, right? I mean, there's, there's a good reason. So why I become more of a pragmatist in this space is learning to speak the language and translate the language of your executive. There, there is no question in my mind ever in my 30 years now that CSR ESG is a trickle down economy in corporations. It really is defined by the leadership. It is supported by that. Um, if you have a a leader that believes wholeheartedly with that comes a great sense of gravity that allows other people to gather in and around you. But it doesn't take away, Rachel, to your question, what you have to do every day to still be relevant in the space. And the reason I know this is because I still argue the same things every year. <laughs> and I, you know, you're like, oh, I, you know, we talked about this before and I don't want to have another t-shirt conversation why people are dying in Maui, right? I, you know, I don't want that, right? So it is important to realize that, that you must come with a set of fundamental strategic reasons for your program, your purpose, and how you're going to execute against it, and then how you'll measure success. And celebration as well, right? Because you got to give the celebration to other people. I always tell people, we're the Navy SEALs and ninjas of ESPN. We come in, we do great stuff, and then we go out. As an example, we just did this amazing event with the NFL yesterday at the Intrepid Museum just before Monday Night Football, packing thousands of packages of food. We put it on ABC in New York. We put it on Monday Night Football. We showed the commissioner and our chairman together, and we talked about our commitment and service to 9-11. That takes a ton of work and a lot of integration, a lot of champions to be able to do that. So that argumenting or setting the standard or the strategy for everybody in your, your geocentric circle is important to keep fresh and alive every day. Well, call us next time because we'll come pack with you. You know that. <laughs> okay. Right, Rach? We'll We're do. ready. We are great packers. We're oh, great my gosh. Packers. Red, I love yes, that. ready. <laughs> you know, one of the ready things that's always struck sleeve. me about the ESPN Foundation is you have kind of the four primary areas that you work in and, and you stick to them. I mean, like, you know, you're really, you're good about being disciplined in what you present. Describe for our listeners a little bit about what your focus areas are. You bet. So I, I, I will tell you just, just quickly how we got there, which is 
There were a lot of people that thought they knew what we should do, but they couldn't articulate the why and how it was going to help the company, right? And so what we did is we filled that gap. And so we went out when I came, I've been here for 13 years in October. And, you know, one of my first charges was, was to bring corporate responsibility to ESPN, right? We had a wonderful volunteer program and we had the V Foundation, which we did a ton of work with. And we had a couple smaller partners, but we weren't global in our effect or national in our effect. We also weren't in the sports sector. I mean, you would go to any conference and we weren't necessarily there, which is really interesting if you're the worldwide leader in sports, right? You must lead in all areas. So what we did is we did some research, we worked with our research team and we said, what are the, in five years, what are the big issues coming down the pike? And what we heard was, hey, did you know that kids are dropping out of sports at the highest rate they've ever dropped out of? And by the way, did you know that when kids drop out of sports by the age of five, if they have not been part of some sort of sports moment, their family or you, you know, peewee or whatever it may be, that they are like five times less likely to be super fans, which means they're not going to watch sports, right? Well, that's a very important piece to us. And right now it's coming true more than ever. And we'll, we'll finish up with that. But you know, that was the first thing we heard is youth were dropping out of sports. And so we knew that was a critical link. We also knew that our stakeholders, the NFL, the NHL, the NBA, they were also worried about that, right? So how do you build an infrastructure for youth? And you, you both know this, but many of the listeners may not know, is that sometimes CSR, ESG gets a little bit complacent and they like to package things together so they sound good, but they don't really mean anything. So, you know, everyone had a Hispanic strategy, you know, six years ago, right? But they didn't really know how to implement a Hispanic strategy. They didn't really know what a Hispanic strategy meant. Then it morphed into Latinx. And what we learned was, is we needed to be much more thoughtful about the strategy around it and what the research showed. But for me, what we said was youth was the new Hispanic, and that got people's attention, which is like, oh, so you're saying that this audience is going to basically dictate the future of our company if we don't do something and become, you know, aligned with them. So that's the first thing. So, you know, once we figured out youth sports, youth were our asset, we looked at how do we mitigate that? from a social issue, but also from a contextual storytelling issue. We're storytellers, you know, we're journalists by trade. So making sure we could tell stories of what was happening. So access to sport for youth was our first strategy. Like how do we make sure every youth knows and parent knows that sport can be fun? And we say sport, we don't say unstructured play because we like rules, we like winners and losers. We like what that brings, what that connotes. The second thing was, is like, okay, so you may not be an elite athlete. You may not be in sports. You know, I didn't, I was, I was a great track athlete, but I was a better gymnast and we didn't have a gymnastic team. So I didn't play sports in high school. I was in a club sport. So one of those things was like also looking at what are the issues that are affecting sports? And we knew that there were social injustice issues. We knew that there were a conversation around women not still not being treated fairly under Title IX, right? We knew that there was an underrepresented, underserved contingency in sports that still needed to be worked on because it was volatile, depending on where you were or who had funding. So youth and empowerment and leadership through sport became our second, which is you may not end up being an a, a, you know, lead athlete, but you may be uh, a journalist, you may be you know, a, a stadium owner, you may be a mother that takes your daughter to soccer practice. There's going to be some connection there. What does sport bring you to enhance your leadership and who you are to reach your human potential? So those were the first two things that, that really hit it out of the park that made people understand why we were in the space. The other two are the V Foundation for Cancer Research, which is we helped found the V Foundation. It's now raised over $300 million for specifically cancer research. It's one of the best stories never told because we're a media company. Fox doesn't normally tell our story. We're careful about being too hubris and telling our own. But our goal is to victory over cancer, to fundraise for cancer research. So we are basically the arm that pays for all of the marketing and research and all this type of stuff so that when people give money to the V, all of it goes to cancer research. So all of that impact happens. 
The fourth part is sustainability, is to make sure that we are doing right and our footprint is right. And as you know, climate change is affecting everything. It's not just, you know, uh, you know what's happening with disasters. It's the effect and change of weather. We saw it at the U.S. Open this year. The heat index was just overwhelming to a lot of people. We're going to have to think about that. Young people need to hydrate better. We need to think about that as a condition of climate change. It's not to say we're going to go in and do carbon credit trading, et cetera. But we need to understand that affects our community. It affects us. The fifth piece is, is basically making sure that we are a good corporate citizen where we work, live, and play. Where our employees are, what they believe in, we hear them, we understand what our communities want. Um, the hard part on that is most people don't understand is that ESPN's brand is way bigger than who we are. We have about 5,000 employees worldwide and we are known everywhere. We're one of the most uh, known brands in the world. So people think we're this giant, huge piece of the Walt Disney Company. We're 5,000 employees of 190,000. So we're, we're a very, very big piece of Disney, but we are a media organization that you know has that that as we used to say ink by the barrel um that people will know us right so those those things were our strategy to help define how we would make a difference in both the sports sector and in corporate responsibility and how do those areas in addition to informing the outside world and in 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 a way bringing forth that voice of establishing what what you want to be and what you want to mean to the world in that respect how have those decisions also informed the inside in terms of employee engagement, in, in terms of kind of sharing that manifesto internally within the, the various teams and extensions of the team, of, of, of your internal yeah, teams? You know, Rachel, it's, it's an interesting question in respect to we, you know, we are a media company. So we're a technology company, it's the best way to describe it. Um, and we have, we're storytellers and we put that story into some sort of digital format that people then consume, right? So for right now, as, as you all know, and I'm going to show where, where I still roll in CSR and business, is that one of the greatest impacts to society and particularly the media industry is how people consume media, right? It's changing every day and overnight. And anybody that carries one of these is now a media mogul. They can be you know, on someone else's to a million people's handheld in a, you know, in a second, right? So I think for us in corporate responsibility, what we said to inform our internal communications team, our content teams, our programming teams that sign the deal with the leagues, is that we need to understand that things are changing so quickly and that society is becoming more educated about purpose. People know what the word purpose means now, right? They understand that there's a collective calling of both their inner self and externally of where they might be or should be. But I think great companies really nurture that and say, okay, our purpose at ESPN is to serve the sports fan anytime, anywhere. That's our mission statement. How we do that is very purposeful as how we direct ourselves to be that. But we also want it to be reversed and say, please tell us what you think is critical because you are the authority in women's gymnastics uh, when there's sexual harassment. You are the authority when dealing with issues, um, you know, in uh, college football or, you know, we, we just got into the world of um, gaming and betting, right? So ESPN Bet has been announced. So making sure that fundamentally people know that we have purpose that they should have purpose, but we're always going to follow a rule of integrity, transparency, and make sure that we do right, do well. Our people can articulate that. And so having that narrative shared internally, Rachel, is really, really critical here. And that, that's what makes our culture so strong. Uh, it's because people can actually tell us what the five priorities of the company are. They can tell us how we should approach it. They will tell you what the mission statement is. And I know it sounds campy, trust me, I don't drink a lot of Kool-Aid, but this is one that really I have seen in ways that very few people can describe, believe in the purpose of this company. So moving a little bit away from like the generic, let me, you know, I know you were the brains or one of the brains 
behind the Choose Kindness campaign, which came from ESPN and, and is now, I think, housed at, at EIF. Um, yes. Tell us a little bit about the campaign. Like, what? Wh where did it come from? What were you hoping for? Where is it now? Yeah, Carol, you know, there are two things in my life, maybe three, that I've done in this space that I know are going to actually save people's lives. And what we saw, so we actually have been in this space for about a decade and nobody knew we were. So the space is basically, it started as kind of bullying prevention, right? And we were in this space because we had a product called the X Games. And we actually went to our athletes and said, so, hey, we want to do a cause around the X Games. And we thought it was going to be environmental. We were sure it was going to be environmental. And what came back was, is, hey, listen, we're not mainstream athletes. And you need to understand that entry into our sport is actually really difficult. We're skateboarders, we're skiers, you know, you know we're parkour, we do all this stuff. We're not mainstream. So we got kind of bullied in high school about our stuff. And it came back over and over and over again. So we actually created a program called Shred Hate, Choose Kindness, which was to be, you know, on the hill skiing or, you know, shredding the board when you're skateboarding. And it was to say we were going to invest in making sure that leadership through sport, right? Our second strategy was that there are leaders in, in particularly high school and middle school who are athletes that should bring people with them right? That should say, you should always be picked or you should always play. And you shouldn't prohibit people from playing. Girls, women, people with intellectual disabilities, you name it, right? So that program became kind of this phenomenon that just kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger. But what we realized is we couldn't actually scale it because we were paying a lot of money to go into each school to create these programs. And we couldn't get to thousands of schools. We could only get to tens and hundreds of them. And so the Major League Baseball came on board and said, hey, we love this program. Would you be willing to do it? So then MLB came on board, but we still couldn't scale it. So then, um, you know, this was about five years ago. Our president said, hey, listen, I love this program. I'm all in. But I think because of social injustice, we need to say what else is there out there that is provocating this kind of this tension uh, in, in the softest words, I can say right, that exists in our communities, particularly in sports, in the locker room, bowling has happened in the locker room, what can we do? So we spent literally 18 months doing research, working with, you know, a number of different organizations, including Harvard and others, um, to create the Choose Kindness Project. And the reason this is, I think, meaningful is that it's the first time that we have brought every single major nonprofit that has a anti-bullying initiative together to create the Choose Kindness Alliance. So NAACP, the ADL, uh, kindness.org, there's 23 of them, right? A Harvard University. And they are working together to bring assets, not to those that are necessarily bullied, but to the parents of children, teachers, coaches, and a, a caring adults. So they have the assets because what we also figured out was in this day and age, parents really didn't, they weren't tooled. They didn't know what to do. They thought the teachers were doing it. The teachers didn't have any time and they were expecting the parents to do it. So we created assets and what we came out of it was to deal with anti-bullying, to create intentional inclusion, right? Which is to make sure that you intentionally bring people, you intentionally have purpose to bring people with you. And then also, which is fundamentally where I think most organizations are going now, is to look at youth mental wellness. What are these youth struggling with that puts them in the space of that? Now that sounds really big and heady for a sports organization, but what we found out is the leagues were worried about this as well. They were worried. The NBA has done an extraordinarily great job in mental wellness, right? Because their athletes have said it. You've seen now the Olympic sports deal with the Simone Biles, Michael Phelps. The, the pressures that are put on them are one thing, but also how, how we as a society allow for people to talk about their mental wellness has totally shifted, thank goodness, right? that we can now do that. So the Choose Kindness Project, Carol, is now at the Entertainment Industry Foundation. We wanted to build something great, put it into an organization that has done great work with the Red Dress Campaign, the uh, uh, um, Stand Up to Cancer. They know how to do cause marketing. We have funded it 
and we're going to have we're going to the, well, all of us are going to the anti bullying forum in in October. But the goal is is to figure out like what is the next iteration of this that will help kids have a more fulfilling and better life and have mental wellness uh, less mental wellness issues as they move forward. You know, it's interesting because you talked about intention, and again, you know, drawing back to Lion Tree, that is, you know, how we describe it. You know, it's innovation with intention. The idea that you know, you can you can build things in many ways, but if you build them with purpose and if that's part of your intention, again, one plus one will equal three. So, you know, and that's part of why I got very excited in the work we've had the privilege to do together. So one other thing I think that when I think about your career that I think you have particularly should be proud of is the move to acknowledge the athletes who are making a difference. Ah and the athletic organizations, and their, the, how they have found their way into the ESPYs. Well, I am so glad you mentioned that. Um, you've done your homework. <laughs> uh, you know, it's really interesting because, um, you know, this company has been working on the ESPYs for almost 30 years, and it's a phenomenal event. It is, you know, it's a celebration of sports. It's, it's I wouldn't call it the Oscars of sports because it's, it's not that, but it is the celebration of sports. And about six, seven years ago now, um, my team and I sat down and we talked about, but wait a minute, okay, what we see at the ESPYs is also not as inclusive as we'd like to see at the ESPYs, right? We're the devil's advocate. We can ask these questions. We didn't have an award named after a woman. And I'm like, why don't we have a name award named after a woman? That seems like a pretty simple approach considering how many amazing women there are out there that have changed the world. And so that started the conversation. We went to Billie Jean King and we said, hey, we would like to do something, but we're going to twist this around. It's not just, you know, having another narrative award like the Arthur Ashe Award on Courage. It's about also developing a course of action that will engage particularly younger people to participate, younger people, expand the audience, to, to also be the next Billie Jean King. We know that's part of your leadership initiative. How can we make that happen? But how can we also make it broad? How can we just blow it up and put it out there? So we created the Billie Jean King Youth Leadership Award. In addition, uh, I had been working with the Ali Center and Lonnie Ali has been so gracious to us in so many ways because we wanted to know some fundamentals about real change and social justice and the work that was done. We went to uh, Lonnie and said, we'd like to cons for you to consider to have the M Muhammad Ali Sports Humanitarian Award. And that will be the crescendo. That's the highest level of award, what you do off the field. And we will build it around that and we will make sure that there's, you know, impact data. We'll also uh, invest around where those people are. And the reason that's all important is because while the ESPYs were moving forward and celebrating the sports, we were doing Use the Power Sports for Social Good, um, and we were also trying to do impact, right? We were trying to put those together. So about three years ago, our chairman said, you know what I think we should do? We should put them together. And we're like, oh, well, that's a great idea. And if you can't see my face, I have a, a, a smile ear to ear because that was always our intention. It's like, how could we make the ESPYs a little bit more about the true impact of what these amazing athletes and leagues and corporations do through sport, right? Intentionally through sport. And so I'm proud to say that we're now in going our fourth year. I'm actually now a producer on the ESPYs because of our work with the, with the Sports Humanitarian Awards. It is in the show. We also have other awards that happen in and around it. But the reason that's important is because now the new strategy around the ESPYs is to use the power of sports for social good, to celebrate authentically athletes and teams and people in sport, and to develop the actions and courses that we would like to see in this universe, you know, through sport. And then fourth, to fundraise for the V Foundation, right? So literally, we got to check off the boxes as we went forward. And now, the ESPYs has always had purpose, but now it has this sense of purpose that really makes you feel good about understanding why we're doing it. Again, innovation with intention. Thank so. you, yeah. And, and, and by the way, we had Jen Pauletta on my team has been leading that effort. Kate Jackson is the producer on it. Connor Shell from uh, uh, Words and Pictures, an external producer. They have all bought into this because they also know the consumer, the sports fan, is actually incredibly interested in understanding why this is important.
It's amazing. And you mentioned earlier about this notion of high tide raises all boats. And it just, it's so intentional in terms of looking at the connective tissue between where these underlying conditions, so to speak, lie and how, and how to kind of raise the profile and looking like it is, it is. And you know, I've, I've it's really, I've gotten, incredible. I didn't get my MBA, but I got it here <laughs> to, cause I now work with yes. our sponsorship <laughs> team and I understand how they go to market. I understand with great clarity, our production teams, I understand how we program on ABC for SBs. And so what that's allowed me to do is to then now use that as a best practice when we do other things like Special Olympics World Games, where we're now the world broadcaster of the Special Olympics World Games. I mean, who would have thought? Because we had intention and purpose to create access to sport, to create leadership through sport, and look at those vulnerable populations. To me, that's, that's the, that is the icing on the cake. You know, one of the things, and you just kind of hit on it a little bit, but we talk a lot about legacy. And we, we talk about, you know, when we're long gone, what are we going to be remembered for? What are, you know, in your case, your nieces, your nephews, what are they going to say about Kevin? Hello. What do you want them to remember? Ah, uh, you guys. So what you need to understand is I cry at car commercials. So if I get too deep about this, you have to forgive me. Um, I, I have been through a lot recently, and Carol knows this as a dear friend, et cetera. And the, the reality check of learning who you are as you travel through the business, but also learning who you are um, from other people's perspectives has been incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and at first it wasn't, but now I understand how much it is. And um, I think for practitioners out there and for people who have struggled through the pandemic and other things um, that exist right there, it's it's giving yourself some grace to make some de decisions that will ultimately not work, to make mistakes. I believe in it 100%. I am not always the most articulate person, but I will try to be an empath to understand why it's important to other people for other people's perspectives. That's what I'd like to be known for is that I didn't always take my perspective and say, well, this is the truth. I mean, there is a Kevin truth. I always go out with it and always demand some, you know, some argument against it, but it is always formed by my collective community, my team, my family and others. And so that's the beauty of this pro of any corporate responsibility program is you're learning you don't go to a community it's it's community 101 you don't go and say here's what you need you ask them what they need and why they need it and how they would like to receive it right so i think it's that i'd like to be known as someone who you know uh you know listened listened but also responded with great authenticity i know that's an overused word but i am i'm like this all the way all the time by the way <laughs> i know that <laughs> I, I i if i'm in front of our board of directors or our chairman or whatever this is me i'm not going to change who i am because i've learned that i'm really good at being me and i need to be me to make things happen and no one's better at being me than me <laughs> exactly 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 yeah that's a, it's amazing because in, in listening about your whole career and where you've been placed and where you've optimized and where you've contributed, it is so clear that it is not what you do, but it is exactly who you are uh, at this role. It's uh it's not a, it's. Thank you. you. Yeah, that means a lot it's for incredible. me. Thank you. So we always wrap up our, our interviews, you know, with a little bit of a gift to our listeners. Yeah. You know, we have the. Whenever you go to an event or, you know, to a conference, you get to take your little swag bag home. So everybody loves everybody swag. Loves so swag. what do you got for our swag bag? <laughs> you know, my swag is uh, going to seem fairly maybe consistent or uh, mundane because it seems like everyone's doing it. But I don't think we're doing it right, which is the one thing I, I if I could pass on to my friends and colleagues uh, as they're walking out with their swag bag is that they reach in there and they pull out this journal. <laughs> and this journal reminds you every day of the obstacles, the love, 
whatever it is that is truly emotionally driven and purpose driven and why you did what you did that day. And I don't mean a Facebook post. And I don't mean a tweet. I mean that this is for you. You've invested in your future when you look back and you're looking at pictures and everything else. You're like, yeah, but you know, I remember, I remember talking about purpose on that podcast and, you know, and it made me feel engaged and vibe to do this one more day, <laughs> you know? Um, so that, that, that idea of not writing down your purpose every day, but how, even if it's just one sentence, it's like, what gave you power? What took away power? What did I learn from? I wish I had done that. I, I have my little book with me, my Choose Kindness book, um, that I start to write every day in my, it's not a journal, but I just write at the end of the day, here's what happened today. And, you know, kind of give it a sense of it. I, I think that's really important for us to be able to kind of navigate from as we move forward. And really fun months down the line to look back at. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's been you so know, many great things, Carol uh, and, and Rachel. I think you both know this, but I mean, we have been so blessed to be in positions like this. I, you know, I've been to seven Super Bowls, right? And, you know, I'm a Seahawks fan, so I don't really care until the Seahawks play. But I have met people and the opportunity that and to bring my brother and to, you know, stuff like that, that I'll never, ever get back. And I'm so blessed to do that. And I just re want to remember those things. Terrific. Well, you know, Kevin, I, I can't think that anyone who knows you or knows the work that you've done will not be moved to do better. <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. We really have just so enjoyed listening to you. I'm so grateful. And thank you. Thank you both. And thank you for talking about purpose. And thank you for making sure that people hear why that's important and how it's, it's, it's a catalyst for really you know, who we all are. We're all looking for why we exist. Perfect end. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen on Purpose is a series as part of Kindred Cast from Kindred Media and Audiation with the phenomenal music by Rachel's 10-year-old son, Noam Krauss. If you like this episode, please make sure to subscribe to Kindred Cast wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review letting us know what you think. We are your hosts, Rachel Krauss and Carol Stern. Thank you for listening.